and welcome. There are some things in life which are perishable. Airline seats, for example, are one. Uh, the other is flowers. Uh, and it's uh, always interesting to understand and uh, maybe go a little deeper into how a perishable commodity or a perishable product, uh, for that matter, a luxury product in this case, uh, works. And what are the unit economics that, that drive it? And how do people who run such companies manage the flow, uh, so to speak? And I would really pose the same question to an airline operator as well, except that that's something that we use in a very different context. So in that, uh, in that uh, very respect, I'm pleased to be joined by Vikas Gudgutia, the founder and managing director of Ferns and Petals. It's an online and uh, offline uh, flowers delivery company. It started as a flowers delivery company, but is now in, uh, in, in a very diversified sense across the gifting space. Vikas, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me over. So Vikas, uh, first question, if you can, you know, give us a quick, uh, you know, little bit of a history of Ferns and Petals, uh, where you started and more importantly, why did you start this? Clearly at a time when no one was venturing into bringing formalization into a very informal space. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like going back to uh, 30 years, 1994. I was uh, a graduate uh, from Kolkata and I had come to visit Delhi. And uh, that was the time I discovered that Delhi as a, as a city lacks good florist because I had the same, we had the same business in Kolkata. So I knew what flower business is all about. So uh, since I was in college, I used to go there for uh, an hour or two to help my uncle. So I had fair idea about uh, how the flowers are and how they are sold and everything. But when I came to Delhi, I realized that there is a possibility and there is a, a vacuum for a good florist who can serve uh, Delhiites better. And I think that was the, that was the triggering point where uh, I started uh, researching a little more and the FNP was started. Okay, I'll uh, come to that in a moment. Uh, tell us about uh, the flower business, Vikas. I mean, what are the determinants on a, on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you manage stock? How do you ensure that most flowers, uh, for the perishable reason that I referred to earlier, uh, leave uh, you know, the shop or the premises by the end of the day or maybe two days? See, uh, that, that, that's, the prob that's probably the most difficult part because it's highly perishable and uh, it is not something which is uh, a daily consumption uh, uh, product in a country. Of course, in Europe and US, people use flowers in their houses as well. But in India, flowers are mostly used for gifting purpose and gifting is occasional. So, an occasional product with highly perishable in nature was a very difficult proposition. First of all, since I was used to doing this in Kolkata, I, I had some basic knowledge about how the flower management and the flower engineering is done. So, so that your wastage is minimal and how the pricing has to be done so that you can kind of uh, take care of the per perishable nature of flowers and the flowers which you lose. So um, I kind of mastered it further in Delhi by seeing how the flowers which have not, which have not been sold during the day can still be used towards the evening for some purpose. And uh, the wastage is minimum. And for that, uh, we started uh, supplying to some institutional uh, offices and hotels where, you know, we, we could supply flowers on, on a weekly basis so that whatever we could not sell was consumed at a lower price, but wastage was uh, reduced. And many such things like, you know, um, getting into uh, a happy hour towards the evening where people can come and book and pick up flowers. So somehow, uh, the most difficult part was the reason we didn't have many organized players in the market. All of them were small timers, roadside ones. So initial journey was tough because to manage the economy and the scale was different, difficult also. But then gradually we kind of uh, mastered that art and that's the reason we could succeed. And, and uh, uh, you, you've touched upon this, but if you could dwell on that a little more. So, what would be the trends? As in, what are the kind of flowers that would, let's say, typically go out by noon or afternoon of the day? And firstly, also, what time would they arrive uh, at your uh, shop? And uh, what is it that you would try and, let's say, push towards more institutional customers? Uh, if you could give us that sort of break up. See, uh, the, the flower scenario at that point of time, 30 years back, was very different than what it is today. It, it, it was very primitive. You just had few flowers which used to grow naturally in different parts of the country. 
were used as the flowers for bouquets and uh, celebrations. There was no commercial cultivation on a corporate scale. There was no organized uh, floriculture farm. There was not much money which went into floriculture. So the flower availability of the flower was very, very poor. And we only used to get four to five flowers, which were typically gladulus, rasniganda, roses, which were naturally grown without any scientific met methodology. So, and those were the flowers which we used to sell in our shops. Of course, uh, rose is, is the most perishable flower out of all these, which wills the fastest. So, the idea was to sell the roses first. And uh, the glads and the rasnigandas used to last longer. So, those were the ones we used to try to keep it for longer period. So, that was the basic four or five flower scenario. So, it wasn't difficult. Now, of course, we have hundreds of flowers and flowers come from all over the world. And we have thousands of farms growing different kind of flowers all over the country. But that was a very different scenario at that point of time. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to the, uh, the, the rose and the, the international part in a second. But tell us about the first problem that you were trying to solve as you were trying to grow. Uh, was it building the, the back-end linkages or like, for example, the farms? So the, the, the two, two problems. First problem was the procurement of flour because there was no organized mandi or flower market where one can go and buy. One has to have direct link with the growers in different parts of the country. And to be able to get the flowers from them, you have to kind of give them a minimum guarantee. And the minimum guarantee can only be given unless, uh, unless you, you know, kind of able to sell a certain quantity. So we are unable to promise the quantity and have to go and buy directly from the grower was the most difficult proposition. So for first and foremost challenge was to increase my sales or increase my, you know, uh, my shops so that I'm able to consume a larger quantity so that I can get flowers at a cheaper rate from the growers directly. That was the first and the biggest challenge. And once those flowers started coming in, I also realized that, you know, uh, why not start wholesaling flowers because there are no wholesalers in the market. And now if, say, for example, I get 100 flowers in a day, if I'm able to consume 30, 40, I started selling those 60 flowers to other florists who probably were facing the same problem. So this adversity to this problem gave, gave birth to an opportunity which ultimately made the retail sustainable. And, and what is that mix today? Today, it's, it's completely different. Today, today, today um, we do not wholesale anymore. Now we've got flower markets wholesale markets in all major cities of the country. Flowers are growing very, very methodically and there are there's a beautiful supply chain which works nicely. So things are very organized, very different now. Now it's like you go and procure whatever you want from the Monday in the morning, you know, 10 flowers or 20 flowers or whatever color. So there's no compulsion now. So to go back to the transition, so suppose you were to take, let's say, uh, 100 flowers or 100 units of flowers uh, where would they come from earlier? Uh, and you said that, you know, you had to go to the money, it was a little random, versus where they come from today. See, the seed flowers, even at that point of time and now, flower cultivation is good only where the weather is uniform. In extreme weathers, all flowers can't sustain. Say, for example, northern India is not suitable for growing flowers around the year. It's only suitable for flowers which can be grown in winter or Kashmir where flowers can only grow at a certain period of time. It's only the the Bombay and the Pune and Bangalore and that was the region which has always been the flower supplying region of the country. So even today, most of the floriculture farms which are large, organized, are in that belt because the cost is lower because you have to pay less to manipulate with the weather. And uh, these, so therefore, most of your flowers that you're, let's say, supplying in northern India, and we'll, we'll come to the e-commerce part in a bit, are really coming to you from uh, being trucked from, let's say, western region or southern region? Not trucked. They, all, they are all uh, flown no. uh, every, every day from those two regions, yes. So, uh, can you give us a rough sense in tonnage? I mean, how uh, tonnage or uh, hundreds of kilograms, how many flowers are going in which direction on a normal day? Oh, it's, a it's a difficult question because I'm not on, into wholesaling and I'm neither growing flowers, but I can tell you. No, this is about your your own consumption. I mean, what, you're the, what's coming my, into your system? My, my, my consumption, I think we, 
we uh, uh, we consume close to five to seven lakh like, stems a day. Okay, and and uh, where would those majority of those five lakh stems come from? They see it's it's a it's a very difficult different mix. Some of them come from some of them are imported. They come from Thailand. Orchid is the place which 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 grows there naturally. Some flowers come from China. Some flowers come from uh, you know um, the southern part of India. Some come from western part of India. So they, I I cannot proportionately tell you which. Sure. flower come from which area and what percentage but it's widely spread but i'm assuming that uh, flowers are coming from thailand and china because uh, not because you're I, i mean not it's not an electronics product where you're looking for a cheaper substitute but this i'm assuming is a higher cost substitute in some ways because it's the value of that orchid that obviously has mo- has uh, aspiration in the eyes of the customer See um, f- what has happened is flower wherever flowers to be grown artificially or with in, in poly houses with extra cost you know and there are some flowers which grow naturally in certain parts of the world so wherever the the weather is conducive and the artificial or the mechanical process is less that's where the flowers are cheaper and that's where it makes sense for flowers to be flown in from so the thailand thailand is the hub for orchids because of the weather and because of the cultivating habit it's a age old flower which belongs to thailand so any country whichever country do whatever they cannot beat the thailand in terms of the variety and the cost and the quantity similarly the certain flowers which which grows beautifully in kunmen in china now kunmen is like heaven on earth in terms of weather no no those flowers cannot grow anywhere you know in that quantity at that price so it, it it's so region wise because of the climate and the cultivating habit which has been there for years right and and orchid is obviously i'm just to pick on that a little more is something that let's say people here are maybe have aspired more for in the last decade or two as opposed to before i mean this is a question yeah i mean if you look at 30 years back people don't won't even know what orchid is all about i mean today orchid is a common flower and orchid grown in thailand is just one type of orchids now if you go in detail there are 100 kinds of orchid of different types which grow all over the world okay and i'm going to come to consumers and how they have been changing as well so let's talk about the e-commerce at what point did you uh, switch to e-commerce and how did that become uh, an oppor- opportunity or an option again given the potential risks of uh, perishability and so on see uh, we were the very early entrant i mean i i realized that uh, i have to be the florist to the world i have to be the, the 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 shop where anybody can shop from anywhere and that was only possible online and it was emerging as a phenomena to to order online it was 2001 almost 22 years back that uh, we started our uh, fnp.com see what what used to happen was that lot of people who will come to our shop and say that i have my brother is staying in chennai can you have it sent Now, how do I send it to Chennai? Because I don't have a outlet in Chennai. Either I have a partner who who can I can send you know order to and he will deliver. Then the reliability was poor. You get complaints in everything. So I think initially it was started more for convenience, so that you know we, that there can be cross city transactions and people can access us from anywhere. Ultimately, it became uh, big business. and and uh, which is your largest city by value right now delhi followed by mumbai bangalore okay so you know when you, when you started e-commerce uh, how did you start putting the various uh, building blocks together uh, one is of course the sourcing of material which you were already doing but anticipating demand and and uh, or responding to demand so did it go as i'm assuming it did not go as smoothly because these things never do but tell us about how that journey was see in, initially when i started it was one one desktop and one person that that's how the online business was started we used to get 3 4 5 orders a day and we used to feel oh as if order is coming from heaven we don't even know the person and order is coming on the on the screen so that that was the initial start but then of course we kept learning and realizing the demand and since we were already franchising we already had close to 20 30 shops in different cities at 
in India at that point of time. And we tried to build a larger network of good florists across the country who could be a delivery partner. So I think the first three years went into aligning the delivery partners and adding more and more pin codes and cities so that we can deliver comfortably. But the biggest problem with the flower business was that the flower business was a business which has trust deficit. All the florists you know, will probably, if you trust them to send flowers, they'll probably send the flowers which are old and about to die, not the fresh ones. So the quality, so people always to feel that unless you go and choose your flowers yourself in a flower shop, the flower scent will be old and will probably not survive. So and that was the headwind, you know, that making people trust a florist to deliver. And that was one, one problem. And second problem was the network that, you know, you are able to deliver in many places. So first three years went into developing that network, making sure that I deliver better than, you know, if you go and choose yourself. So that confidence started building in and then it was a gradual process. And at, at most of these times, you didn't, you never had a competitor, I, I would imagine. Yeah, luckily, even today, I mean, um, we have competitors independently in colony-wise or maybe smaller city-wise, but on a pan-India basis, even after 30 years, we are, we are the only one. Right. And, you know, at one level, uh, considering that so much capital has flown into so many e-commerce businesses, uh, you could have, I'm assuming, also raised, or did you not deliberately do that, or did you try and maybe not get the capital that you wanted uh, at least some years ago? See, uh, when I started business, all these startup and PE, all these words were not existing. People used to do their own resources, you know, take money from here and there and start their business. It wasn't an organized supply of money. So that option was not there when I started. And what happened was that in the first seven years, by the time I broke even, I was already in debt. So, you no, know, serving debt is a pain. It took me three, four years to get rid of that debt, to, 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 to become debt free and start making money. So I've always been a very orthodox kind of a businessman who who realized that debt is a pain. So so don't take loan, don't take uh, cheap finance to to fuel your this thing. Whatever you earn, keep flowing back, keep flowing back. So for the I started making money. If had become a brand, we were doing very well. I had six seven verticals running, but if you ask because Nutia personally, I did, didn't even have a flat. Because I invested every penny that what I earned back into the business to grow the business. And, and, and at one point of time, uh, when people realized that it's become a sizable big company with no debt and no uh, private equity and nothing, and it's a, it's a profitable company year after year. So, so that's the fruit I'm, I'm reaping because of, of that hard work of 15, 20 years where every single penny earned was invested back in the business. So you, you've never raised capital, that means? We raised last year. Okay. And uh, what prompted that? See, uh, my dream was always to have an IPO. I always wanted, you know, from the childhood, everybody has some dreams. So I thought that let the company be traded in the share market and, you know, um, the speculative value and the valuation of the company. So there was a strong desire to, to, to go public. So when we decided that, okay, we, we are worthy of going public, let's hire a couple of bankers and advisors and see how we can take it further. There's a time uh, a lot of advisors advised us, why don't you lock the value of the company once by investing, by, by diluting a small bit so that your valuation will be established. And then you take some money, you spend money on branding or maybe expansion so that uh, since it's a growing business and a successful business, in two years' time, you multiply further and then go for IPO. So it was a stopgap arrangement before the sprint. Yeah, actually, that was my question. I'm saying, did you do a pre-IPO raise as opposed to uh, the IPO itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you, you can say that kind of a thing. Right, and and uh, uh, you know, tech is an important part of any e-commerce uh, venture. So how did you build your tech? And that too, I'm uh, all this while obviously using internal accruals because. Many other companies who have been in e-commerce, even smaller versions, have invested a lot, obviously, in people. Uh, there are a lot of incentives. There are attractive e-sops and so on. 
and you seem to have done it without all of that tech has always been our you know uh, the big priority i always i always realize that tech wise you have to be ahead of others to be able to sustain the you know sustain the passage of time so but but luckily uh, initially we used to outsource and you know uh, get get it uh, looked after by an outside agency then i think uh, 2000 Seven eight, we uh, hired a tech head, and we built our own tech team. And and then onwards, we have been investing uh, whatever is required from our own equitals. Right, and and tell us about now uh, as you've grown uh, today. Uh, what's the kind of uh, you talked about five to seven lakh stems, and and tell us about what is the consumption and consumer behavior that you're dealing with on th- two or three different levels. I think one is on a normal day, which is off season. Uh, or I don't know what is off season for you, but you, uh, I'm, I'd love to know. Second is, for example, the big season, like a wedding season or uh, New Year's and so on. So those spikes I could understand. But what happens on a normal day? See, uh, what I'm talking of, talking about five to seven lakh stem is a normal day situation. Now on 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 occasion or a heavy day, of course things are different. And now for the last maybe uh, seven eight years. we don't look at flowers as a commodity any further we have become a proper gifting company where where we have more than 30000 gifts from flowers to cakes to chocolates to plants to personalized and we are in different geographies we are uh, overseas in few countries we are delivering all over the world so the whole game it has become of a different dimension where flower is not the talking point anymore of course flower remains the most relevant but we are talking like a proper gifting solution company now right and and uh, you know someone who goes to your website uh, even if you buy flowers you're offered chocolates and cakes and uh, and so on and so forth which you can add and uh, sell but the thing that struck me is uh, at least i've been curious about is how how does it all come together because a florist is obviously an independent entity from a chocolate maker from uh, let's say uh, whatever a chocolate sub- uh, a cho- i mean sorry a cake maker versus a chocolate supplier and so on So that that's the reason initially when when we're building the uh, this particular category we we used to outsource we 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 used to have tie with cake shops all across the country and we used to deliver to third party third party we realized that cake is becoming big and we we opened our own uh, cake uh, brand called FNP cakes and we have 170 shops today uh, all across the country and we deliver through our own outlets so now the quality is under control the retail brand is prospering and uh, similarly uh, we are adding white labels now in chocolates and other things where where we feel that demand is there and the quantities are there so uh, we will keep doing that for all other categories also in the coming times and and so what are the big spikes uh, right now in india when when is it that demand really shoots up see uh, i think wedding season is the biggest trigger which is november to february November to November to February is winters. It's it is festivals, weddings. That that's the celebration time in this in this country. So that's the peak period for us. And peak period starts with Diwali, which is the beginning of the wedding season, and Valentine's, which is very big for us, which is probably the end of the wedding season. So it's between the Diwali and the Valentine we have our busiest period. And then of course Rakhi and other Mother's Day, Father's Day, smaller occasions. They keep coming around the year. So, would you say now that, with obviously so many years behind you, you have a fair sense of how demand will move on a one is normal day and b these uh, these sort of big uh, uh, wedding seasons or other uh, other big celebratory occasions? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can, I can, without blink, blinking my eye, I can tell you immediately that after after ten days on this day, what will happen? So that that's the experience, and that's the that that that's the kind of. Uh, Uh, journey we have been through, so it, it's it's all uh, very clearly defined now. Yeah. So uh, you know, I just just to come back to the unit economics part, how has that been changing as you've uh, you know brought in delivery, as you've combined more uh, gifts into the into the package, so to speak, and uh, how is the the cost of delivery working out versus let's say what people are willing to pay for the whole thing? See, inflation has definitely affected us. Because uh, inflation has uh, increased the cost of lot of a uh, lot of uh, ingredients and inputs which go into delivering a gift, 
and that definitely has its impact on the profitability unless we increase the price, which we have not. Number two, I think the 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 demand and the and the and the requirement of the society and especially with the Gen G coming in is changing every day. It's very very dynamic. So so one has to foresee what's going to be the next thing in demand and how to be ready with with, with that particular product at, at what price range. So I think the marketing team is doing an excellent job where we are able to foresee what's going to happen in the coming times and how to counter the inflation. And I think the most important part is that we've always been very, very extremely careful about that we have to make many money every month. So we accordingly adjust our costs, cost, costs are cut. We try and reduce a lot of things which we probably do otherwise in a good month. So we, we, we manage somehow, but profitability is, is the most important part as a business trend for, for me. And uh, I'm going to come to the, your, your sales breakup in a second, but you know, uh, you talked about being able to predict what's going to happen 10 days down the line, and uh, which I'm sure is the case today. But tell me about an occasion where you've been completely caught by surprise. I think uh, it was COVID time. Uh, I mean, we, we, we thought that uh, it's bad time and COVID time um, at the time of Rakhi, uh, I think 2020, 19, 20, 20, 2020 Rakhi. The first wave, yeah. 20 Rakhi, we didn't know what to do. Orders were flying like, I mean, we are unable to trade the orders. It was that kind of a mad rush. And during Rakhi, during COVID, there's so much of restrictions with, you know, people are scared of delivery. You know, and the whole team of 500 people working around the clock and everybody from myself to every junior staff in the office is packing Rakhis and trying to create a dispatch. That, that, that was something which I'll never forget, you know. When, when it pours, it pours like mad. I mean, it, it was... We were praying to the God, let's stop. Let's not take any further order. So so that's a very memorable uh, Rakhi for me, COVID Rakhi. So uh, in today, uh, and you have many ver verticals that are under fnp.com. So tell us about what's the rough sales bre breakdown uh, in percentage terms, if you like. And I guess starting with flowers, but I don't know if flowers is your biggest, uh, uh, biggest uh, sort of sale selling item anymore. See, I, I, I will break my uh, all the verticals into three different different uh, zones. One is, of course, FNP.com, which is a retail, online, offline. That is the biggest, which accounts for almost 60% of our uh, total uh, turnover. 20% is our weddings. Weddings means our wedding decoration, wedding planning, wedding venues, whatever we do under a wedding umbrella. And 20% is rest of 6, 7 verticals. Some of them are startups. Some of them are growing. So that, that's how I break the whole uh, FNP breakup. And, and, and I know you've attempted uh, some other things, including street food, which haven't worked out. Uh, and you've also taken away some lessons from what I could understand about the way you structure these companies and in future. So is that something that you're applying now going forward? I think that was the biggest lesson of my life. I mean, uh, I would, would not have been successful if I wouldn't have failed, you know, doing Chatak Chat. Chatak Chat now was the name of the venture. And it was 2007, seven eight when things were doing very well. I thought it's time for me to unleash another, you know, big uh, opportunity and, and take it to the next level. And that madness resulted into a complete uh, wash out, I can say, of ferns and petals. Whatever I had, I'd ruined. I was in debt. And in those four years, I learned a lot. Every day was like going to a school called struggle and, and, and you come back, you know, uh, knowing something better than what it was the day before yesterday. And those four years taught me so much, so much. And I, when the Chatak Chat was closed and I started my second journey, I put a second journey because I was literally on footpath. You know, I had nothing um, uh, in 2009, 10, 2010. And uh, I started the journey again. But yes, 
I had my lessons very clearly, you know, written in my head that what to do, what not to do, how to do, and all those lessons from that nowhere to today in twelve years, thanks to Chhatrapati Chat, the failure. Hmm. And and you you still didn't raise capital at that time at that point, which you could have, I'm assuming. No, no. I I somehow um, wanted to. See, uh, I, I'll give you an interesting story. You know, as, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, I listen to a lot of people, but I am somebody who doesn't like interference in the decision making. From the very, very beginning, that's that that's been my DNA. That you know, if you have a stakeholder or a partner, you have to listen to that person. You have to kind of uh, have that uh, dual. Uh, responsibility kind of a thing where you know one can accuse each other, one can praise each other. So I wanted it to be my way or highway kind of a thing. So I didn't have any second person. I was the lone person then. I'm the lone person now. Of course, last year we have a very uh, healthy uh, investment, and, and the and the people who invested. I must say I've been up very lucky that uh, we got some some of them and got them. Who are very, very, you know, they they leave it to you and they trust you completely. So it was just because I didn't want interference. I didn't have anybody, you know, kind of be partner me or invest in me and or whatever. And and you're saying that's changed now. I mean, you. I will not say changed, but I can say now there's a method to the madness. You know, uh, earlier I was maybe arrogant. Earlier maybe I was uh, taking too much risk. Uh, uh, sometimes risk, which was societal. Now, uh, now I've started calculating those things with with, with my experience, with my knowledge, and whatever I've learned. So, uh, yes, I, I, I'm definitely much more careful now. And of course, my son has joined me now. I have to listen to him because he's a he's a next gen and he has his own way of looking at things. And I have a lot of senior people who have been there with me for 15, 16 years, 18 years. My current CEO is there with me for twenty-five years, so the whole team is so old. It's like family. So of course we discuss among each other, and I've started listening much more now. Yes. Just to go back to that street food example, so would one takeaway be the maybe the mistake of an early diversification, or what's your thought on because you are diversified now to some extent, or are you uh, in a way confident that all of this still fits in, let's say, the gifting category or the experience category and so on? I think that I I understand your question, and I feel uh, basically two learnings. If I can give you a larger picture, first learning was that you know uh, stick to your core competence. Food was not my competence; it was more of a desire. If I ask myself why Chatak Chat, I will say it was just maybe a crazy idea, and I wanted to convert this. My my why was not clearly defined. So after well after Chatak Chat, whatever I've done in my life has been either either flowers or weddings or some kind of a uh, planning, you know. In terms of uh, we have last journey, which is funeral planning, and a couple of other things. So now I try to try and stick to my core competence. And second lesson I can say is that never buy a car unless you have a good driver in hand. You see, uh, so uh, if you have a good driver, even if you buy a Not such a good car. One can drive well, but if driver is not right, the best car in the world will not function. So I think that the two large lessons which which are governing my mind right now. Okay. Uh, last question, uh, Vikas. So as you look ahead, and I don't want to take you too far ahead, but at least let's say the rest of the year we recovered from COVID, and there's an interesting experience that you've already shared. I'm assuming things have gone back to pre-COVID levels, or maybe even better than that. But how is the next year looking, and what are you doing uh, specifically or generally uh, in 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 this market or in in uh, at this time? We are very optimistic. To be very honest, we are very optimistic. And uh, as I said, that we always look at two years hence, and uh, we 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 start doing our R and D and all our efforts work two years prior to its its you know this thing. So and if you ask me honestly, I'll say that the real time of the brand is now. 
I think the initial hard work, all the foundation and the overall uh, positioning is complete. It's the takeoff time now. So we will take off next year onwards and probably we'll have IPOs and the idea is to become the, the true global gifting company. And, and uh, one last supplemental question, which I, uh, I, I can't go without asking you. Uh, what is the one flower that you feel conveys emotions the best in India from your experience as someone who's dealing in this for so many years? I have two answers to this. Mm -hmm. If you ask me roses, of course, no, nothing like a rose because that, that's there. A red rose means love. No, no, nothing conveys more than a red rose to an Indian or to, to, I think, almost anybody. But to me personally, I love anthurium. Anthurium is a heart-shaped flower. This is very beautiful to look at, and uh, that's the flower for me. And 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 what's the best selling or the most selling flower on your system now? R roses. And 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 I'm assuming it's red roses as opposed to other kinds of roses. Fifty percent red rose, fifty percent other colors. Right. Okay, Vikas. Thank you so much for joining me, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you.